Welcome to the book at the end of the shelf. My name is Christopher St. Clark. On this cold and windy evening, I'm sat alone and in the dark. I'm here to read you bedtime stories that are far from PG or mild. I wouldn't choose to play this podcast if you're listening with your child. Some of these are dark, some are funny, most are downright gory. But when you open the book at the end of the shelf, there is always a bedtime story. Episode 3. Connie Pollyanna Saves the World Connie Pollyanna was a normal girl. Well, at least she thought she was. Until she saved the world, she had big brown eyes and auburn hair. And she loved this planet with genuine care. She cared for the wind that shook the trees, and she cared for all those busy little worker bees. She cared for the grass between her toes, but she did not care, not one bit for those. Those scary men who took the woodland life, who sliced it down with their jagged knives. And she was scared of those who filled the sea with their plastics, with their oils and their loose debris. Next are the people that destroy the land, who turn great valleys into sand, Connie was scared of them all the same, and they started to plague Connie's lonely brain. We'll end this world, they'd say in the dead of night, filling Connie's dreams with an awful fright. Why, she would cry with her tear-filled eyes, this planet never hurts, steals or lies. We want its money, and we want its gold. We don't care about the future, we're already old. Connie Pollyanna had heard enough. She stood high on her bed, her arms so tough. Be gone now, you monsters! Get out of my head! Let me sleep one more night in my cosy bed. I'll see you tomorrow, but not in my dreams. And nothing on this planet will help your screams. She woke the next day and walked down to the woods. There at the lake, six lumberjacks stood. Just before their big sharp axes swung, Connie Pollyanna screamed from the top of her lungs, Cease and desist! You wretched men! If you do not stop, then I shall count to ten. They looked at her with a growing smirk, and then all of a sudden their bodies jerked. Their laughter brought them close to tears. They laughed for what seemed like twenty years. But it was only ten seconds until their laughter stopped, and when they saw what they saw, their faces dropped. (whistles) On Connie's command, a thousand cows, sheep, bears, and squirrels, and tawny owls trampled the men into the cold, soft ground. And none were saved, and they were never found. No, they slowly turned into the woodland's food, and Connie was feeling in a better mood. With triumph in her heart, she turned to those at sea, the ones pissing oil out so frequently. She traversed the waves upon a thousand birds, carrying Connie in response to her kind words. They gently placed her down upon the oil rig. No one feared Connie Pollyanna, for she was not big. But they should have done, for in her stony silence, it was hard to identify her innate violence. She plodded along to meet a stubbled man who sneered at this girl and her master plan. What the fuck are you doing on my boat? What are all these birds? Is that a fucking goat? Listen here, mister. For you, I have a proposition. I trust that you're a smart man. There will be no opposition. I offer you a cease and desist, as the planet has grown tired of the death, pain and destruction that those like you have sired. I kindly ask that you stop operations and leave instead, or all of your subordinates will end up dead. Who the fuck is this kid? This nine-year-old thinks she's great. I say no to your proposition. Well then fuck you sir, I'm eight! She kicked him in the shins and with a hammer broke his jaw. The baffled workers gasped and stood and watched in awe as she mashed him to a pulp. Swing by swing by swing. Nothing remained of this man's face after she found her brutal win. 
and with a whistle through her fingers, the army of birds attacked. In their haste, the workers tried their hardest to fight back, but they were lifted so swiftly from the ground and then dropped from the sky in a bone-crushing sound. As the last poor worker faced the drop, it was as if the planet decided to stop. There was an eerie silence that filled the sea. But Connie Pollyanna stood, smiling with glee. She had found her purpose, her call, her meaning. As a hundred bodies lay still, Connie's face was beaming. Mistress, was this wise? Did they really need to die? Said the seagull general with his beady little eyes. Yes, my friend, they did. They all needed to perish. We love our ocean, we need it. It is something we must cherish. We aim to restore life, to bring our world peace. For the planet to breathe freely, these activities must cease. But are we not doing this for humans too? I, I can't help but feel that anger's gotten the best of you. She petted the seagull lightly, two taps upon the head, but she did not reply to him. No more words were said. But in the days that followed, that seagull was nowhere to be found. She told the animals that he'd gone to fight on foreign grounds. Connie had arrived with a conclusion that for the world to be saved, she must reprimand the oil giants, the billionaires who misbehave. She had amassed her army more. Humans were even taking up the fight. If for the greater good of the planet, they believed that bloodshed was all right. As long as it brought peace, if it saved their burning world, these people and animals would rally behind this eight-year-old girl. Judgment Day was coming. An attack was being planned. The army advanced, pour in pour and hand in hand. They encircled a great skyscraper, the HQ of the oil giants. Connie floated on her birds, her arms crossed, ever defiant. Unfortunately, they no longer had the element of surprise. Her cruel actions had been found out, shared and publicised. From the CEOs to the cleaners, they had all taken up arms. No one in that building was going to allow themselves to be harmed. You should have seen it. This skyscraper, almost as tall as the Shard, was armed to the teeth. It was like something out of Die Hard. Except in Die Hard, there aren't squirrels running a political campaign, or bears or killer seagulls. Well, they could only hope for John McClane. When the attack began, Connie Pollyanna for once showed mercy. Through public pressure or her conscience, she no longer would play dirty. She spared the lower floors, concentrating her attack right at the top. The animals ran up the windows as the bullets began to pop. Connie and her seagulls smashed through the top floor. A CEO with a machine gun was waiting by the door. He opened a barrage of bullets into the twisted, winged mass. The seagulls started to drop by the dozen, thick and fast. They were shielding their leader well. Directionless yet brave, they could only hope that their strength in numbers would cause them to be saved. The gunfire soon finished. The CEO whimpered loud. The seagulls soon dispersed, evaporating that feathered cloud. Connie stepped forward, sure-footed. Her efforts had not been slowed by this cowering man as he desperately tried to reload. She swiftly grabbed his gun, throwing it straight from the tower. The strong, determined look on her face was growing ever more sour. Please don't hurt me. I I I'll do whatever you please. I'll, I I'll give up the oil. I I'll be vegan. I'll plant a thousand trees. Please, your lady, your almighty, so, so stupid I have been. But it was swiftly over for him. She reached in and ripped out his spleen. She chucked it to the goal so they could have their mid-battle snack. Then she beckoned them to grab his body and to call off the rest of the attack. They picked the carcass up and flew it out to sea. They dropped it into the ocean from 150 feet. It crashed into the waves and slowly sunk down to the bottom. And over a million years, that CEO was of course forgotten. He actually was pressed and crushed amongst the ocean's weight and became part of an oil spill off the coast of what's now Kuwait. All right, I will stop now as I have gone a little bit far. And as the writer, you must be wondering what my political views actually are. Well, that's the thing you see. I don't think politics should be involved in the climate crisis. It's just something that should be solved. There should be no debate, no left and no right. We shouldn't get to a point where we have to take to the streets and fight, because this is what would happen. In this revolutionary setting, it would still breed tyranny, which of course is upsetting. 
it doesn't matter how noble the course, if you force the powerless to fight, when they eventually get their power, they'll begin that age-old plight. And so the wheel goes round and round, as it has for a thousand years, crushing all those unfortunate enough to be down on the lower tiers. Anyway, I feel I must warn that I didn't make Connie up. No. She's out there. She's real. She does not give a fuck. So if you're buying shares in the most corrupt of all the powers, if you're in the forest cutting down trees and ripping up flowers, if you're eating large amounts of unethically sourced meat, or maybe just dropping your Coke can in the middle of the street, Connie may be lurking, her activities now in the shadows. You may just disappear, maybe get washed up in the shallows. Maybe you encounter her lions, maybe you get bitten. Or maybe you're just ripped to shreds by her army of tiny, fluffy kittens. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Connie Pollyanna Saves the World. Um, this is certainly a weird one compared to the others. Uh, I wanted to explore how power corrupts, like even something as as noble as saving the planet and something as innocent as an eight year old girl. Like, how can we make, yeah, how can we make power corrupt this person? Um, and I think I got a lot of inspiration from pro probably Game of Thrones. And I actually started writing this when I was quite little. Well, not little, but like years and years and years ago. Um, certainly, in a, in a, <laughs> a lot of a younger mindset than I am in now. And I thought, yeah, this could be a children's book. This is great. Like, what if the main character just, you know, just gets rid of everyone on the planet that's bad for the bad for it? And uh, yeah, I, I took it to my partner, and she said, no, you cannot make that into a children's book because it's disturbing. Um, I thought it had, you know, squirrels and bears and stuff in it, you know, stuff that's in a children's book. But I've adapted it for this instead. I've got a few announcements to make uh, for Raising Cane Productions. So firstly, we are going on tour in March. Um, we have got our show Last Shot and Confess. These are two back-to-back -back thrillers. So they take place uh, on the same night. They're both 30 minutes long. It's like watching kind of a TV episode, um, but it's live and in front of you. And um, Last Shot follows the story of a director and an actor who are filming the last shot of their god-awful film. In a, in, a, in a village hall and um, their kind of past misdeeds are unraveled throughout the narrative um, and Confess is about Martin who runs a support group called Confess where the whole premise is that you come and confess your deepest darkest secrets um, however two people turn up confessing things that Martin doesn't really want to hear um, so these we've already toured these once um, got some great feedback for it um, so we're, we're touring them again uh, rurally in Norfolk. We're hitting um, eight village halls and theatres. Um, you can check out all the dates online on RaisingCaneProductions.com um, to get your tickets. If you're local and if you're not local, you can come and travel from wherever you are to come see it. Um, it's all site specific. It's all set in the venue that you see it in. Uh, yeah, so tickets online at RaisingCaneProductions.com. And then, of course, do do please follow Raising Cane Productions on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. If you enjoy the book at the end of the shelf, please, please share it. Tell your friends about it. Tell your family about it. Um, yeah, keep sharing it around. Um, and join us next week for Peripety. So Peripety follows uh, the story of Ollie, who is out walking in a field when he kind of witnesses his own murder taking place. Thank you for listening and join us next week for another tale from the book at the end of the shelf. <laughs> <laughs>